And God, if my life is broken tonight, God, I know it's your hands that it definitely needs to be in. If things are not the way I want them to be, God, I know you're able, Lord, to do it this service tonight. I surrender to you, Jesus. I surrender, Lord, to you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, would you just take a moment longer and lift your voice to the Lord? Would you talk to Him all across this house right now? I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. Would you lift your voice to Him and begin to talk to Him? Jesus, I give you everything. No strings attached, God. I release everything into your control, Jesus. Lord, I pray the rest of this service be in your hands, God. Lord, every word that's spoken, the response to your word, we need to be in your hand right now, Jesus. Have your way, oh God. Have your way, Lord. Have your way, oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I was driving a few days ago, and I began to think about the blessings of God. We're going to Genesis 26. And, uh, and how that sometimes, with the canon, the blessings of God, I don't always see them coming. And sometimes it seems like it overtakes me from behind and I didn't see the blessing on its way. Sometimes the blessing of God doesn't seem to be in our present or future, but they overtake us from the past. And that was the blessing of the promised land. These blessings, the Bible said, shall overtake thee. That was the prayer and confidence of David. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's the voice from behind that says, This is the way. Walk ye in it. It's the mighty cloud of witnesses that are cheering you on tonight saying, We did it. You can do it. You can make it. Praise God. Praise God. It's it's a Moses and Elijah meeting with Jesus Christ before Calvary. Saying, we know it's going to be tough, but you're going to make it through. So in that vein tonight, God led me to a story in Scripture that I want to take us to. It's about a man named Isaac, but it's also more about a man's father named Abraham. Genesis 26, verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Another translation says, where it says that he dug again the wells. Another translation says he reopened the wells. He restored their names. There's another significant verse verse that I want to read later on before I conclude tonight. But to me, it represents what our wells are today. But for now, I want us to claim this, all right? Simply my title tonight, The Well is Still Ours. The Well is Still Ours. Hours. Would you pray with me right now? Lord, I thank you for the wells that our fathers dug. I thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we've experienced as generation upon generation. God, help us, Lord, that as we, we revisit some of those wells tonight, <clears throat> if we discover that they're stopped up, if we discover, Lord, that those wells aren't flowing in our lives, help us tonight to redig or reopen these wells. Help us, Lord Jesus, to declare your word with boldness. And Lord, you to, to, you to confirm your word with signs following. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. <clears throat> it's good to have you on Sunday night here at Harvest Church. I'm going to do my best to preach. For some reason, I, I get up here and now I can't talk. But I'm going to drink a little water. Maybe it will help us tonight. The well is still ours. They haven't went anywhere. They're still there. <laughs> I remember going to a little town. I can't remember if it was Fisk. It wasn't far from Fisk if it was. Where my grandfather would take me, Brother White, and he would show me an old, old house. 
that had a well. But those folks apparently had gotten city water because there ain't no way they used a well that, that he showed me, you know. Not currently, at least, you know. Grass had overrun it. And uh, matter of fact, I asked, I called him Paw Paw. I asked Paw Paw, I said, is there any way that we could get some water out of this well? He said, I'd be afraid to drink it today, you know. But those wells, old wells that are still there, Abraham, he's the father of faith, and you know, he lived in three dimensions. The biography of his life can be expressed in three words. Tents, altars, and wells. Tents, altars, and wells. Tents in that he was a sojourner. He looked for a city with foundation whose builder and maker was God. He built altars. Who can forget the altar of covenant built by Abraham? The sacrificed animals lay in a row at the evening hour and vultures would come to claim their prey. But the old faithful Abraham fought these birds back until night came. And then when night came, the burning torch that passed through the row of animals and pronounced the blessing upon Abraham. And then wells, wells. It was a harsh climate in which Abraham lived. The desert always threatened. You think having a well here is a chore. You ought to try to dig one in the desert. Drought was always in the wing. Although Abram was a pilgrim, he learned there is an importance when you're digging a well for you to dig it deep and to bless the areas that are around you. The wells were his indiscriminate blessing to everybody who needed it. You would even find where the lady in John chapter 4 would tell Jesus, Oh, you're sitting on Jacob's well. But Jacob didn't just let his family drink from the well. Everybody around came and drank from the blessing. He, Abraham lived in a hostile country surrounded by enemies. But the well was a visible, tangible example of God's love that if you want a little bit of water, all you got to do is come to the well. Can I say tonight, it's the same in the spiritual still today. This ought to be a place where if somebody wants the well of living water to flow out of them, they ought to be able to walk into this house and find that the well is still pumping, honey. The well is still supplying. That souls can be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Friend, we are known less by what we consume by ourselves than we are with what we share with one another. Abraham was a giver. Everybody say amen. amen. So Isaac, Abraham's son, he has, it, it's, it's, it's really sad. He only has one single chapter that is exclusively devoted to him in Scripture. Now dad, he's got a whole bunch. You know, you, you read all about Abraham. His son Jacob actually has quite a few chapters about him. But Isaac has one. The Jews say only one chapter was needed. And that Isaac's name did not need to be changed as his father's and his son's were because Isaac quite simply heard from God, obeyed God, and passed the test. But now you find Jacob, he heard from God, sometimes obeyed God. And had to keep taking some tests over and over again. And finally, he gets back to Bethel and renames that place. And that's the place where his name gets changed. And he says, you're going to be called no longer Jacob, but you're going to be called Israel. And from that moment, but now we're talking about Jacob's daddy. He didn't have to have a name change. The setting is the Philistine country, if you read about it. Right where his father had once grazed the herds, famine strikes. And Isaac, he starts to do what his father had once done. He starts to move to Egypt to ride out the famine. But God says, no, stay here. And Isaac obeys. See, it's nature that says, when problems show up, I need to move and get away from my problems. But sometimes, Brother Seton, it is the will of God for the child of God just to dig a little deeper right where he is. You see, for us, it's a whole lot easier to tuck tail and run. 
And if we ain't careful, we'll train our kids. And when you got a problem, well, it, it, you know, you really don't have a problem. You just need to change locations. And so now we have a whole bunch of people that are running from problems that are chasing after them, nipping at their heels like hungry dogs, and, and, and they can't get away from the source of the problem because the source of the problem is really them. Listen, things get tough. I know. Life is difficult. And life, oh, here we go. It's not made for sissies. If you're going to have any kind of life at all, you're going to have to buckle up your bootstraps and fight for it. And here we are in a spiritual world today. And friend, I'm going to tell you, if it's ever rough spiritually, it's rough right now because people bring all kinds of spirits with them. And we're fighting this and we're fighting that. And then we leave and, and we go to work and what happens? Oh, it's multiplied for sure at work. You know, you got all kinds of stuff that you're coming in contact with. Can I, and I'm not going to name the church and I'm not going to name the man because I don't want his church to get vandalized again. But over in California, there was a pastor that stood against a library story hour last week. Because of some drag queens that were going to do one hour of story hour in his local library. And he stands up and he says, now I'm not being evil for the, I'm not being hateful to these folks. But he's saying, I cannot send our church kids to this. He didn't say don't have it. He didn't say any of that. He goes and they actually broadcast his statement. I don't think he even asked for it to be broadcast if I remember right. They broadcast his statement on the news yesterday and he gets up this morning and there's all kinds of profanity that is spray painted on the side of their church building. Used to, Brother White, all we had to worry about was rotten tomatoes. And I say all we had to worry about, that was rough. But now things are even worse than they were then. Where the only hate groups that ever get mentioned are the Christians. But you, st you speak and you stand up for God and you'll be labeled a hate group. But you speak against God, you're a hero. We're in rough times today. We are in a time where things are going to get rough. And the only people that are going to make it are those the Bible says that shall endure unto the end. I'm not saying we get calloused. I'm not saying we grow cold to this world, but it's not time for me to think that I need to just run from my problems and say I'll get victory if I move somewhere. No, friend, that's a lie from hell. You need to learn to hear the voice of God. You need to learn to hit your face in prayer and say, God, I need fresh water right where I am. Oh, like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, I shall not be moved. All the wind of false doctrine can blow, but I'm still going to believe in the one true living God. I'm still going to believe in the born again experience. And so we live in a very difficult time today. A very difficult time. The test of faithful people is, can you sow even when there ain't any rain? I've drove, Brother, Brother Claybrook, between here and Trenton, there's a whole lot of burn up corn. Whole lot of burn up corn. And if they don't hurry and get that corn out of that field, and get something else in that field for the next season, what's going to happen? They're not going to reap anything. You know, in the spiritual, sometimes we got to sow even though it looks like a famine. In Isaac's obedience, we find him sowing in the middle of a famine, and the Bible says later he's reaping 100-fold. Can I tell you something tonight? I feel the Lord dropped a word in my spirit that if you will stay faithful and not move from where you are, God will bless you. He will bless your family in ways that you cannot imagine. If you'll make up your mind, I'm going to serve God. Come on, somebody, that I'm going to do what God has called me to do, even in times of uncertainty. He and the little boy. God's going to give you not only the desires of your heart but God's going to bless you beyond what you're asking for but I've got to dig deep I've got to make sure the well is flowing my 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 so now let me get to my preaching points Isaac didn't stop there 
He didn't stop there. We read Isaac reopens the wells of his father Abraham. Now notice that Isaac started by saying, before I go dig a new well, let me clean out daddy's old well. Why? Because I remember how the water tasted. I've heard some of you folk talk about mom and dad and had a well and there ain't nothing like well water. Is this what's happening to Isaac? I remember what that water from daddy's well tasted like. I remember what it was like. And new wells sometimes fail to satisfy like the old wells do. Life will get you into places where new wells just won't satisfy. You know, pastor's not against change. We've changed a whole lot around here. I don't fight change. I recognize that over time, many things change. Including hair color. God help us. Yet, now I'm not experiencing that personally, but yet, yet, I've had, my, I've had my ear to the rail of modern human experience and I sense what people thought would satisfy them does not. Amen. It's called the sin of Jeroboam. The sin whereby man made all of Israel sin. What did Jeroboam do that was so bad? At first glance... What he did make sense to the carnal mind. He set up altars in the north and in the south of Israel, in Dan and in Beersheba, and he made it convenient to worship God. Because you know, Brother George, people can't climb that hill like they used to. I'm not saying you can't. You can probably still climb all them hills out in Ripley. That's <laughs> That guy got loose from that state penitentiary the other day. All I could think about was that hunting land up in Ripley. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, they'll never find that guy if he crawls off in that cut zoo. There ain't no way they'll find him. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. But I can just hear the voice of convenience as he hollers and he says, you know what? Some of those people, the children of God, are getting kind of old. They can't climb that old hill of Zion anymore. So I'm going to make an altar on the north and I'm going to make an altar on the south. Makes sense. What happened was they began to worship at a new well called convenience. And they satisfied a whole lot of religious people at the moment. But it was never the plan of God. The time people spend in church is declining. And when I say in church, I'm not just talking about church services. I'm talking about events within a church. All of that is declining today. Matter of fact, when I first started pastoring... Lord have mercy, we probably had something five nights a week. And I started realizing we're wearing people out. And so we went to a planning session and I said, hey folks, I'm, I'm afraid we're wearing people out. I mean, this was, this was the time, I think it was just a couple years into pastoring. I don't know how, how many of y'all were, still, were, were with us at that point. But, but at, man, at one point we was having prayer meeting every night of the week. And, and we did it under the auspice of, if you want to come and pray, you can come and pray on your own night. You know, Tuesday night sometimes don't work for some, but Monday night will. Can you imagine trying to please everybody? So I just said, hey, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to open the church up. And so what ends up happening is the spirit of pastor just says, you know what? If people are going to be at the church, I need to be there too. So I was here five nights at least a week. Sometimes it was closer to six because of, you know, just trying to make sure everything was ready for the weekend. And, and, and so I know that even church schedules have had to change. I'm not necessarily preaching against a schedule, but I'm preaching against a mentality tonight that is trying to creep its way into the church house. Because what we will do is we will worship at the altar of convenience or a well of convenience and we miss... A move of God. In other words, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I don't think there's ever been a busier generation than we live in. My Lord. And it seems like it's getting worse. Everybody's just busy. And busyness is not bad. But sometimes it ain't good. But all the while, if we're not careful, we can be busy even around the church house, and the waters are drying up. People's souls are being famished. I still believe that church ought to be a priority. I expected about 30% to say something. My God, if it was a work day, and I thought I was going to sleep in, my dad would have brought a belt in that room. I'm telling you. He said, we're going to church. 
it was something small, if the church doors were open, I was going to be there. And no, it was not just because I was the preacher's kid. It was because engraved in my dad long before he ever became a pastor. Anybody remember what night my dad got the Holy Ghost? Today you try to have church on Christmas and you tell me how many people show up. We did it. We did it when it fell on a Sunday. Now we had more people show up than I thought I would and that's bad. I had to repent and tell the Lord I'm sorry. I didn't think that many people would show up. My dad got the Holy Ghost on Christmas night. So it was ingrained in him from his pastor from the very, very get-go. When the church doors are open, you're there. They had church on Sunday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday night. Started over Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday night. Every night, every week. I'm not talking about revival. I'm talking about that was their regular schedule. Many people came out of that church because of commitment to God. I'm not saying I won't go to that many services. My God, it'll wear us all out. But what I'm saying is, is we have to get away from a mindset that says, well, if it's convenient, I'll go. We're worshiping at a well of convenience, and I'm going to tell you, that will grow dry because eventually Sunday won't be convenient. Forty-second Psalm speaks of a man that says, As a deer pants after the water brook, my soul pants for you, my God. My soul is thirsty for God. But listen carefully to what the psalmist says next in verses 4 and 5. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With the voice of joy and praise. With a multitude that kept the holy day or that kept a pilgrim feast. But look at what he says in verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Yes, when I remember the old well of worshiping God, even when it's not convenient, I would go with the best of them. When I remember what it was once like, I will look at myself and say, I can drink again from the same old well. I can find the well of worship one more time. You see, there's some people that will seek the wells of tradition. That was the problem in the New Testament where one time the law had been the the golden goblet of understanding, if you will, and now it was choking the spiritual life out of God's people and rules abounded. Outward religion was taking place. Hypocrisy reigned supreme and Jesus confronts a woman in Samaria at Jacob's well and he looks at her and he says, you drink from this and you're going to thirst again and soon we find out she was living a sinful lifestyle but still claiming clinging to religious traditions of her fathers. Brother White, it amazes me. She's been, with, she's been with five men and she's with her sixth, but she can tell you where church house is. And she can say, we know our fathers worship over here. Listen, just because people go to church don't mean they're in the church. Hear me today. We got to make sure she she knows that there's all this fussing about which mountain it is to worship in, how many people are trapped in sin, but yet are still fussing about spiritual traditions today. I'm preaching that religious tradition will not satisfy. We got to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the maker of the well. We got to get past just going through the motions of being a Christian and develop a relationship with him. There was one a time that, that religious events and ceremonies were joyful things. Ask the early church that broke bread from house to house. Oh, how different it was from the daily stale sacrament ceremony that's offered up in religious orthodoxy today. Or you can ask the Ethiopian eunuch what he thought about baptism and you would find something totally different than what's being practiced today. Or ask Cornelius how he felt when the Spirit fell on him for the first time and that life-giving Spirit has been reduced in our religious world to a dogma and ritualism. Tradition will not satisfy the thirst of a thirsty soul. Tradition is an empty well that gives you a whole lot of promises that it cannot fulfill. But it leaves us weak and it leaves us confused But Harvest Church, we can be just as guilty as going through our ceremonies and our services just because we think it's the right thing to do. But we must seek a divine Holy Ghost intervention every single time we gather 
together. I don't want to just go through five songs in a sermon. I need the Holy Ghost to shake this house. I need the anointing to be upon every singer, upon the preacher, upon the response. I wish somebody would hear me right now. For it is the anointing that makes the difference. Hallelujah. I don't want to just go through motions of a service. We can do that. But it ain't going to get us anywhere. Another well people try to pull up to. And that's the well of accommodation. You let pastor preach a conviction sermon. Boy, the hall ministry will get going quick. All of a sudden, they'll find a reason to walk out. And it advertises our religious, some of these religions that are going to accommodations, is just come and have it your way first. Here's the deal. Let me, let me just do a poll. This, this ain't going to embarrass you, okay? I promise. But I want everybody to participate. How many would just drink a bottle of water like it is right now? How many would just drink a bottle of water? Raise your hand. All right? Now let me ask this question. Now the same hands can go up. How many would drink a bottle of water if I poured crystal light in the middle of this bottle? Would you raise your hand? Wow. That's good. The pure drinking water folks won that one out. You know what the dentist said when I took, took Matthew to the dentist? She's asking how much water he's drinking. I told her, I said, he's drinking some. And then she said, are you having to do what other parents are having to do? And that is put a little something in that water to make them drink it. Why? Because water can just have no taste. if you. And we get this mindset that if it don't taste good, I don't need it. I don't want it. But if we squirt a little something in that water, they got that grape stuff at Walmart or energy drinks, you know, just squirt it down in there. and then, Hey, water will give you energy to buy itself, but anyway. You know, squirt that stuff down in there and want to drink it, you know. And I know we struggle drinking this sometimes because it doesn't have the right flavor. You know what some people are doing to church today? I'm going to go find a church with my flavor. <laughs> in other words, ooh, that just, that just hits me wrong. I need to find somewhere else to go worship. That's all right. I think it's funny, too. That's all right. And we've watched people drink from these wells. And you know what? They're satisfied for a little while. They are. They think, they think they're satisfied for a little while. But you know what happens? You know what happens? They end up becoming spiritually poor. Yeah. And they watch their children take things to a level that they weren't comfortable with. Hello? And they find their spiritual health dwindling. You know what scripture likens it to? Eating husks. Anybody want to just go have a, a helping of husks tonight for supper? Big old heaping helping of husks. No. Why? Because it ain't going to satisfy. I hope you feel the burden on Pastor's heart tonight and the love I'm trying to preach to you with. That if we're not careful, We'll turn to any of these wells thinking it'll satisfy us. But can I tell you, there's some old wells that we could re-clear out and it would bring satisfaction and strength to us. That's why we've done what we did this past week. Thank you for unifying together. And those of you that would participate with us in fasting and praying, what we have been doing is trying to clear out some old wells. William Barclay put it this way, it is not the things that are obviously bad that are dangerous. It's the things that are good, which are dangerous. For the second best is always the worst enemy of your best. When we give ourselves completely to God and when we say not my will but thine be done, you know what we do? We find strength for our soul and we find help for our need. Remember David, when he was running from Saul, he grew thirsty. Thirsty for water that did not come from a stream. Thirsty for water that came from the well of Bethlehem, the one he drank from as a child. Some of his mighty men broke through the enemy, crowded around that well to get him the drink that he desired. 
word. Perhaps that's what we need is a fresh tenacity that says I want to be refreshed from some old wells. Accommodation isn't getting the job done. Tradition isn't getting the job done. Uh, I'm talking about all of these things that we've referred to tonight. It will not satisfy us uh, but if we'll clear some old wells of prayer and fasting and commitment, uh, what we will find is there will be true satisfaction that will come to you uh, from the Holy Ghost. tell you something. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Everybody believe that? Well, Then let me stop here and say if it worked for them, why won't it work for us? I'm not saying their methods is what worked. It was their message. And yes, we could change our methods. Keep the same message and, and have an impact. And when I say methods, I'm not referring to prayer. I'm not referring to those things. I'm talking about the presentation of the gospel and the services and how we conduct our services. I, I know, I know, I've been back to those, those churches where they asked if anybody had a song. I've been there. Preaching one, one night, I didn't get up to preach until almost 10 o'clock, and I thought, dear God, these folks want to go home. This is no exaggeration. It was like 16 songs later, I was getting up to preach, and I thought, whoo. I don't know if they're tired, but I'm tired. Because my dad always told me, you go preach somewhere, you need to be on that front row ready to worship, and you worship as hard as anybody else is worshiping because when you get up to preach, you don't expect anybody to preach with you if you ain't worshiping. Took that one away. And so, man, I had worshiped as hard as I could worship, Brother Josh. But about 10 songs in, I'm thinking, dear God, if I'm going to preach, I'm going to save some of this energy. I get up to preach, it's 10 o'clock at night. We don't get out of church till 11.30. Those people were used to it. I was wore out. But you know what? You drop a visitor in one of those services. How are they going to get anything? They're sitting there thinking, man, i got to get up and go work the next morning. <laughs> Some of our changes are not bad. That's why I'm saying Some of the changes are not bad. Hey, I don't believe, listen, listen, you, how many meal plan? You meal plan during the week? I've got a few. Some people scared to raise your hand because you think everybody's going to think you're a nerd. No. <laughs> no. We try to meal plan. But then my wife gets to work and she says, you know what I'm hungry for tonight? Would you go by Walmart? Now, hon, we just ordered. We ordered our groceries and I went and picked it up. Now you're wanting tacos, you know. That happened last week. Oh, oh, oh. I saw that look. Oh, Jesus. Help us. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it happened to us last week. It must have been a spirit in the air with our fasting or something. We was fighting it, man. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, 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 we will meal plan. Well, listen, I don't believe there's anything wrong with locking ourselves away and praying and asking God, what do you want us to preach? I believe sermon series can be just as on point as, as individual sermons throughout a year. After a wreck, I come in the next day, I'm praying, I'm crying. Brother Andrew, I was having a good old pity party at first, and then there was conviction that fell. And I'm sitting there going, oh, dear God, I'm here by myself looking at a hot mess, and I'm thinking I'm glad ain't nobody here. I'm praying, okay, God, this is happening. I'm getting tired of these expensive sermon illustrations. I need you to talk to me right now. Talk to me. All of a sudden, the Lord says, go get a piece of paper. And I began to write my sermon series for my broadcast. I just began last Sunday. I did the second message in it today. The Lord gave me 17 sermons, just, I mean, in one prayer session. Boom, 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 boom. Now, I ain't got them all wrote out, but I got the outlines at least, you know. And the Lord began to talk to me. You know what happened? Today I get a phone call from somebody that's just going through town. You tell John this. I don't know if he's watching or not. Tell John. They were just going through town. I'm going to tell you, it's a miracle they picked up the station. Our, our signal is so down right now. It's a wonder they even picked it up. It's a God thing. I'm telling you, you can pick it up in Humboldt. That's it. And so they are driving literally through town at 840. I think it was 8. He told me 841 or 842. I mean, he was specific. He said, I'm driving a truck and I was dropping off a load to one of your factories here in town and I heard your message. This is a man that has been burned in his life. My title of my sermon today was Burnt. It come out of this wreck. All right? And I'm, I'm talking about how that, that airbag had 
burn my arm, and, I, and the Lord begins to talk to me through that. And, and, and I preach this message. I don't, I don't necessarily mention the wreck in the sermon, but that's how I got the inspiration. And I'm sitting there, and I'm writing this sermon out, and I'm talking about how that I've had, uh, I had situations that I've had to deal with as a pastor and people burned in their relationships. This guy calls me today, and he says, Preacher, I don't know if you just happen to say that, just to be saying it. But he, he called the church phone. I'm sitting there very rarely am I by the church phone on Sunday afternoon. I answer it, and he says, I have just come out of one of the nastiest divorces that you could ever imagine. I pray with him over the phone. I'm telling you, we go through times in our lives, we don't know why we're going through them, but things get birthed out of them and it blesses somebody else. These wells that we've got to go back to, it's not just for our benefit. We need people to feel the difference when they come in here. God, help us that they don't come in here and feel condemnation, that they would feel the conviction of the Spirit of God that would draw them to Him. Adversity always comes when you reopen wells. Let me say this. The Philistines had emptied debris into Abraham's wells. They had stopped the flow of water. They did it on purpose. Why? They didn't want anybody to get any strength from some old wells. And when Isaac purposed to reopen them, he was fought by enemies to reopen the wells. Why would you fight with somebody to reopen a well? Guess what? Enemies still guard the well of conviction. You start feeling personal conviction, somebody will come along and tell you that ain't necessary. That's why it's called personal conviction. You don't talk it to nobody. You just do it because that's the spirit that's directing you. Now, God's conviction from his spirit will never contradict his word. So check the spirit. They will always, enemies will guard the well of consecration. You'll have every excuse in the world not to come. The enemies of the well of repentance are still there. Isaac reopens one well, but herdsmen of Abimelech quarreled with him over the water. You know what he named it? Essek. You know what that means? Contention. He moves on. He don't give up. He just keeps reopening wells. He goes to the next well. The Philistines get angry with him here. He calls it Sitna. That means enmity. <laughs> At this point, most of us would have thrown our hands up and said, my God, I'm, I'm reopening wells and I'm still having to name them bad names because bad things keep happening. Most of us would say those old wells ain't worth it. But I want to say tonight, there's always opposition to reopening wells. For in the spirit realm, the enemy's like a cruel landlord. He's a cruel taskmaster. And when you start to make great strides in God, he's going to pull out all the stops and try to confuse you. 1 Corinthians 14.33, Brother Danny's going to throw it up there for us tonight. It tells us, my God is not the author of confusion. We preach that and we shout about it, but we don't read the rest of the verse. He says, but he is the author of peace, as in all churches of the saints. If there's anything that is the will of God, it is for the peace of God to be at work in and through His church. I'm preaching to you tonight that confusion you're feeling is from hell and you don't need to give in to it. You need to give in to the peace of God that says I'm going to give you peace that you'll lay your head down at night and you will be able to sleep. Don't give in to the confusion, but let God give you peace. Imagine with me. You live in an apartment with no heat, no AC, no running water. Boy, it's miserable, ain't it? <laughs> the walls got holes in them. The roof has holes in it. There's no screens on your window. There's no locks on the door. And the floors have stained linoleum. Boy, that's a bad picture. But each and every day the landlord shows up saying, I need the rent. And he ain't gonna let me live there for free. No. Ain't nothing free. Somebody's paying for it. Imagine also that one day somebody knocks at your door and says, Hey, I purchased this building. You can live here for free if you want to. Can I inspect the property? And as the new owner walks through, he's noting everywhere every little hole is, where everywhere a lock needs to be put on a door. I mean, he's making all kinds of notes, and he says, I'm going to promise you one thing. This place is going to look like a new place when I get done with it. 
Meanwhile, the old landlord comes back up and he starts knocking on the door. I need my rent money. You got a choice. You can either listen to the demands of the old landlord or you can embrace the promise of a new owner. Now let that sink in spiritually. I am condemned and I am confined to always living beneath my privilege if I listen to the old landlord. But if I can accept the hope and the promise that is given by a man that spilt his blood and purchased me, I don't know about you, but that's an easy choice for me to make. I choose to stand upon the promises of God and his word. If he says I'm going to make it, I don't care how bad things get. He said he's going to patch the hole, then he's going to patch the hole. If he he said he's going to put new locks and protect me. I'm going to believe that he'll do what he said he's going to do. To Isaac's credit, in the face of the opposition, they said, you might as well quit digging. He just kept on a digging. And I think that's what God is saying to us here at Harvest Church right now. You need to keep reopening these old wells in spite of the opposition. The bees may be stinging you, but the honeycomb is sweet. There may be giants in the land, but the land is flowing with milk and honey. There may be adversaries, but God has an open door in front of us for us to walk through I'm almost done Isaiah he ignored the threats of the old landlord that's what we got to start doing we got to quit listening to the devil boy he'll feed you a whole bill of goods he just kept digging he, he just kept reopening wells he reopened a third well and you know what believe it or not brother Matt no opposition he calls it Rehoboth you know what that means I have found room here. <laughs> Woo! He goes to a fourth well. He calls it Sheba. That's the well of oath. He remembers the promises that he's made. And after his fourth well, God appears to Isaac and renews the promises that he made to his father. All that I've said to this point was symbolic of another well. And it's a well that was spoken of in John chapter 4. This is the second passage that I mentioned and I'm going to close with it. Jesus said of Jacob's well, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But look at verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I know there are problems all around us but nothing else satisfies the soul of man but the spirit of God. It should overflow within your heart. Paul says don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the spirit. So tonight in just a moment we're going to ask for the spirit to fall all across this house and we need to allow the spirit to overflow in our life for the well is still ours Jesus provided it for us he said if any man thirst let him come unto me and let him drink and out of his innermost being is going to flow rivers of living water John said Jesus is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost we're not searching for another well for the well that we need is still ours we still need the Holy Ghost for I can't preach without it I can't sing without it. I can't live without it. For the difference maker is the Holy Ghost. It's not in the cosmetics of a church. The difference is the Holy Ghost. The difference. Everybody say the difference. Hear me. Hear me. We cannot forget we need the Holy Ghost. Pastor, I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I know that, sir. I know that, ma'am. But this ain't a one-time thing. This is a continual infilling. This is a continual flowing of the Spirit of God. And if we're not careful, we'll experience the move of the Holy Ghost, but not allow it to flow. But we allow the well of the Spirit to be blocked by carnal thinking. Oh, it's quiet up in here. Mm. Mm. I 
I've referred to it so many times. It's our stinking thinking. Our carnal mind. The Bible says is enmity against God. We try to reason things out for ourselves. Rather than heeding the spirit inspired word of God. Paul said the natural man receives not the things of the spirit. The will of the spirit. It can be blocked by thinking or by things that are in our hearts. A coldness toward God and His people. An unforgiving spirit, strife, envy, jealousy, hatred. These things will block the flow of the Spirit. Or there can be hindrances in our daily lives. We say, there is a God, but maybe we live like there isn't. We say, Jesus is coming soon. We still preach what the old timers preach, but some of us don't live like the old timers live because I don't think we believe it. Our daily life is filled with everything but the Spirit of God. God wants us to return to that well and say the water, the well is still ours. And I believe there is a spiritual outpouring that belongs to us. For you are a child of promise. I didn't even tell my wife and and Elise what I was preaching tonight. And as they began to sing, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I thought, "Uh uh-huh what I'm going to preach tonight. Don't forget whose daddy you've got. Don't forget who it is that brought you into the church. And if it took him for me to get in the church, it's going to take him for me to stay in the church. In other words, I can't get in the church and think I can fly solo. I need the Holy Ghost. Those that are down to sing here in altar time, go ahead and come join me. I'm going to come to the keyboard in a minute, but I want you in place. Go ahead and get back in place. Brother Cannon's working nights for the next three weeks, so he's coming doing worship and going to work. So we're going to end this thing out in just a little bit. You see, this is what has happened time and again. People have come to the fountains and been refreshed, and they found that God is their help in a time of need. So I'm reaching out to you in this place. I recently read, I'm going to close with this story about a missionary. He was ministering with a group of 20 preachers back in a rural village. And they would go to a river in the early, in the early morning to bathe. And one of the men, <laughs> bad time to get a cramp in your leg, you know. <laughs> He's out there. It's deep. He gets his cramp in his leg. If you've ever had one of them cramps, they just don't give. And you'll get up, and you're trying to walk it off, and you just can't, you know. Woo! Drink more water, okay. So. But the current of the river just kept carrying him deeper and farther from the shore. Boy, that's scary. We went and floated the buffalo. Drew McFarland got out there, and he started hollering because he couldn't move, and the current was starting to take him under. Boy, that scared us that day. Scared us to death. You talk about boats emptying and people going to help now. Some of you haven't moved that fast since then probably. But, man, we were moving. We was trying to get him out of that water. Thought, dear God, how are we going to explain this? Mama was there too. She was right. That current wasn't nothing for Mama. I can tell you now. She was going. She was going to get Drew that day. Man, we, we got him. I can only imagine what's happening in this story, you know. And you're, you're out there and he's trying to trying to get clean, and he, he just keeps getting carried farther from the shore, and he's struggling and struggling. The watchman looked at one of the preachers he knew was a good swimmer, and he shouted, Save him! But the man who could swim only stared at the struggling man, trying to figure out, what's, what's he doing? <laughs> again and again, he commands the preacher, Save him! But the preacher didn't move. And finally, when it seemed that the man who was drowning, could last no longer. The man who could swim was by his side, pulling him to safety. The watchman was thankful that the man survived, but he chastised the lifesaver. Why did you wait so long? The swimmer said, I I could not go any sooner. Had I gone sooner, he would have been too strong. And he would have took me and him both under and we'd have both drowned. He said, I had to wait until he was ready to give up. And only then...
could I save him? I'm speaking to somebody in this room right now. You feel like giving up. The Lord's waited till this moment. You're at the right place at the right time for God to help you. And the Lord says, I see you're struggling. And now I know you're not going to fight against me like maybe if I'd run to you immediately, you would have. I can do something in your life now. You will allow me to be God. Some of us have wandered from some old wells. We're drinking maybe from some new fountains that we thought would help us, but it ain't helping us. From spiritual wells... You maybe have wondered from spiritual wells of prayer, praise, conviction. I encourage you today, it's time to clear out the old wells. I speak to someone today that's in crisis. Maybe you've lost your bearings. You need a fresh starting point in life. Not a new location. You're just reading the voice of God. He's, He's saying you need a fresh anointing, a fresh move of the Spirit. I speak to people who have known better times in God. You've known a time where it seemed like God would talk to you every morning, but today you struggle to hear His voice. God seemed more real and nearer to you yesterday than He does right now. I speak to those whose joy has withered away. You don't know where you're going to find strength to put one foot in front of the other. And as I said earlier, you're tired of fighting. You're tired of trying then why not believe the promises of the new owner and quit listening to the old landlord that says you can't make it? For the new owner has come that you might have life, the Bible says, and that you might have it more abundantly. I'm going to encourage us tonight to drink from some old wells because nothing will satisfy like the well of living water. Would you stand with me tonight? And I wonder, would you help me pray right now? And let's ask God to move in this place today. Lord Jesus, you see exactly where we are on this Sunday night. And we're asking, oh God, for you to move in this place, oh Lord. God, we know, Lord, that nothing is impossible with you. And we know today, God, you know the end from the beginning. And we're praying, Lord, in this service tonight that you would help us. If we have wandered off from wells, Lord, that used to satisfy us. If we've wandered off, God, from that place, Lord Jesus, Lord, where we have found true fulfillment and satisfaction before, help us, Lord God, to make our way back to clear out those old wells. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, say, I'm drinking at the springs of living water. Say, I'm drinking, drinking at the springs of living water. From fountains that I know, from fountains that I know, will not run 